Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this fourth webinar organized by the World Data System. Um, let me first uh, introduce myself. This is Mustafa Mokrain, Executive Director of the International Program Office of the World Data System. I would like to make some practical announcements before we start. The audio is broadcasted through your computers, so I suppose you're hearing me at the moment. If you have any uh, technical difficulties, you can use the chat panel and, and talk with the organizer. We will take uh, question and answers after the presentation via the, quest the question and answer panel available on the right-hand side of the, web the WebEx window. So please use these at the end when you're invited to ask questions. Today, our guest presenter is Dr. Leslie Wyborn from the National Computational Infrastructure at the Australian National University. And her talk is about combining high-performance computing with high-performance data to enable data-intensive science. Um, welcome, Leslie, and I would like to hand it over now to you for your presentation. Um, okay, well, thank you, everyone. I presume you can hear me. Um, this is a presentation that uh, on some work I'm now doing at the centre with uh, Dr. Ben Evans, who is the Associate Director. Um, it's a talk about high performance data and high performance computing, but I would like to give you some background as to how this infrastructure kind of landed in our lap and we are rethinking and optimizing what we've now been given. It's a very um, unusual story. It's made us realize that it's not about big data anymore, it's about high performance data. Can you programmatically access it? And how we've had to now start focusing on building a hybrid data compute architecture and that is leading a shift from small-scale stovepipe science efforts to large-scale collaborative systems science. And then I'll have a few keynote messages, take-home messages at the end. So this is what happened in Australia. From about 2006 to 2015, the Australian government put some fairly substantial funding into developing what we in Australia call e-research infrastructure. The first tranche of funding, which was about 2006 to 2011, only allowed for 75 million for what we call e-research infrastructure. The rest went into sorting um, domain capabilities such as marine science or earth science or terrestrial science. We then had another round of funding which was somewhat unexpected but we must be grateful for what we got and that was the 2009 to 2013 and another 900 million was given to us 347 went on to e-research infrastructure and one of the stories behind it is that if you remember 2009 was the global financial crisis this is one of the things that the Australian government invested in to buy infrastructure to try and kick the economy going. For whatever reason, the funding was designed to provide Australia's research sector with ongoing access to a high quality operational research infrastructure facilities. And it was built by the community in that the community was saying this is the science, that w this is the infrastructure we need to support our science. Now, as you can see from the graph, there's a substantial drop-off, but we have managed to um, get some funding, but for 14, 15, and 15, 16, but it's only, if you like, to sustain what we've got. We haven't had any new major funding. So it doesn't matter, we're doing quite well with what we've got. The funding was in two parts. As you can see on the next, in the top piece, we've got what we call research integration, and the bottom bit is the national capabilities. 
And the national capabilities was just like the nuts and the bolts, the iron. That was two um, petascale supercomputers, NCI and PAUSI, investment in upgrading our networks, and another beast called the Research Data Storage Infrastructure, and I have a slide on that as well. Above that, there was the Australian National Data Service, as well as the National E-Research Tools and uh, Resources Program, which was designed to actually provide generic research tools to link the science capabilities to the um, hardware and iron that was at the bottom. So looking at the research data storage, this is the amazing story because there was 50 million Australian dollars and there was a total of six primary data nodes and two additional smaller nodes. And what then happened was there was a call for collections that could be deemed to be of national importance or national collections that other research could be built on. And you can see in the, um, like the pipes, you can see what each um, data store has a capacity for. And at the moment, we're just doing this massive ingestion of all this data. So you can see that NCI, which I now work for, had about 10 petabytes of storage. One of the other important things that they realised was that this was not just research infrastructure for academia. They also had research as in government agencies. But it was very, very quickly realised that the bulk of research data by volume actually sits in the government science agencies such as Geoscience Australia, the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO. So it was part of like research infrastructure and the government agencies quickly realised that this was an opportunity for them to leverage potential infrastructure because although they were data rich, they were bandwidth poor and to some extent infrastructure poor. And the idea was that if we could get the data onto the system then we could share it with the research community and there would be more innovation that would follow. The important thing is we went from very little infrastructure at 2009 and in fact the cry from the community was no more um, big computers, do something about data. And so with these investments, if you can see by 2013, you can see that we had these multi-petabyte data stores, we also had the cloud and we had some specialised computing. And although we have the 40 gigabit bandwidth links, as the data assets grew and grew and grew, it just was not enough for us to be able to ship the data around. And a transition started to happen, which I'll go on with. So in Canberra itself, at ANU, we scored a 1.2 petaflop supercomputer, a 3,500 core high-performance compute cloud infrastructure, and the new data center which had persistent disk storage of 10 petabytes. Now the funding did not really come with the uh, nice bits of staffing or money for electricity to run the thing and so the government agencies, the big ones, went into partnership with NCI to provide the additional funding to help sustain it. And what we realized was that this infrastructure gave us the opportunity to have a core of specialisation in environmental science, including earth systems modelling, climate and weather, geosciences, water management and earth observation. The funding enabled collaboration for the partners in particular. It created the opportunity from being just a massive tape library where you downloaded the data. It started to facilitate entry into large-scale multidisciplinary data-intensive science and it enabled us to do computing at resolutions and scales never before possible. So what NCI then did was we said we want to specialise into becoming a high performance data node. We want to dramatically increase the scale and reach of Australian research by providing nationwide access. But more importantly, we realised the scale at which we were working at, we had to facilitate access to those data collections in situ. 
and we specialise by getting those collections that do benefit from close relationship with high performance computing and we wanted to facilitate their use in effective research methods and realise synergies with other national research programs. Now here is a list of some of the data collections which are divided into those five groups I talked about earlier. And you can see we're not playing around. These are fairly substantial data sets and not something you're going to um, put on a few floppy disks and send around to your friends. These are the Australian data sets that are on the system and as well we have some fairly significant international collections. Now I guess a list of data doesn't mean much to most of you. This next slide shows what it means to the science community. So you can see that we've collected all these data assets from the core right through to the um, astronomy collections and they are from these organisations. And what we all agreed was that we would put this on this 10 petabyte suspending disk but that we would not have, oh this is the Bureau's share, this is GA's share, this is ANU's share. We actually divided it up into those collections. And where we had, say, LIDAR data from Geoscience Australia or the Bureau or CSIRO, we also agreed that we would try and work together to have harmonised standards so that it would be one LIDAR collection, one magnetics collection, so that we could aggregate the data and start to do really big picture data intensive science. And so again, it was an agreement to the agencies and the trade-off for them as to why they were supporting it was that it meant we put all our data together in one site rather than saying GA wanting to do a joint project with CSIRO and having to bring the data into either GA or into CSIRO. Okay, so it's all there together on one collaborative infrastructure. The important thing about, sorry I'll just go back, that slide's not coming through very well, but what we actually did was then architect the data with the um, compute, so the compute was either region or the cloud, but it's connected with very high speed, low latency networks, 56 gigabits per second. What this means is that we can get fairly fast access to the data and we can start to overcome the issue of the I.O., which is a bit of a problem some of you may know when you go into HPC. So whereas a traditional HPC centre as of four or five years ago was a sort of massive CPU factory and didn't really have all that much data attached to it, we now have the two coexisting and co-located and it's a huge difference. And I can emphasise it by the last peak machine NCI had, had 140 um, teraflops but no access to persistent storage. The new system was 1.2 petaflops with access to 10 petabytes. So this is a switch over that's happened and it's starting to actually get to this message of bring the compute, bring the people, bring the tools to the data. So um, I'll just move on to the next one to give the complete graphic of the architecture. You can see how we've got the data, the compute and then to the right we're starting to set up cloud we're also moving to having the data accessible as services, with server-side visualisation. We're moving a lot more to the server-side and having the web time analytics software as well. So if you like, it's a complete closed architecture. So when you actually look at what we've done, combined and integrated, the collections are too large to move. Bandwidth limits the capacity to move them easily, even with 40 gigabit per second. The transfers are too slow, complicated and expensive. And even if you can move the data, who else has got 10 petabytes of spinning disk? So we're changing our focus to moving the users to the data, the processing to the data, and having online applications to process the data in situ, but it also means we have to focus on improving the sophistication of the users. So we're coming to this new system design where storage and various types of co computation, computation are co-located and the systems are programmed and operated to allow users to interactively invoke different forms of analysis in situ over these integrated collections. 
And the data have to also be kept in sync versioned and back referenced to the supplier. Again, I say that we can't like have the data in multiple formats. We have to try and agree as to what's the most optimal format so that we can do multiple um, use cases. So one another way of looking at it is, I've seen some of you have seen this diagram of mine before, where we sort of say, well, if everything's in balance, all your balls are the same size. But what we've got at NCI is this um, fairly massive compute and data. But the elephant in the room is the data, because although it's big, we cannot access it without really rethinking what we are doing. And so our tetrahedron in reality is we've got this huge amount of compute. We don't have many people with the experience in using it. The data is not optimally organised for interdisciplinary access at this scale because nobody's tried it. And we also want to have it so that we can analyse these data through transparent workflows. And that this diagram is actually where we're trying to head for and get a balance between these balls. So a lot of people say to us, well, all you've got is a big data problem. Well, I've been in this game for 42 years and I've always had a big data problem. I've always feel that big data is a relative term where the volume, velocity and variety of data exceed the capacity of wherever I'm at for accurate and timely decision making. In other words, it's about having more data today than I had yesterday, such that I'd need to find and apply different ways and means of processing it to meet my deadlines. And so as you can see, if you look at this, um, well, one kilobyte in 1964 was two metres of tape or 20 cards. At 2014, a four gigabyte thumb drive is 83 million cards. So therefore, we felt that we needed to define high-performance data, which is data, and we have published this definition, standardised and structured so that it can be used in data-intensive science on HPC. In HPD, we manage the data, not the media. The size of the data, as I've said, we have to be able to run multiple types of analyses because we cannot afford multiple copies of the same data in different formats. And so going back to my earlier days in this game, we've come a long way because this stack of cards holds five megabytes of data. The copy of this talk is 55 megabytes, 10 times the stack, and my USB was 800 times the stack. And so that's why we've come out with this definition to actually say, in time, you've always got a big data problem. We've got to focus on the fact that we don't have the data access fully sorted out for data at these volumes. So I want to show you an example of a data, uh, one of our HPD collections, which was built in collaboration with Geoscience Australia. And so you have 857,000 Landsat scenes. And if you do the calculations, if you've got those on a tape store, it actually can take you 18 months to get each one of them off. So what they did was they partitioned these into spatially regular time-stamped tiles, which are then presented as a temporal stack. Another way of looking at it is we took all these Landsat scenes, got them all off tape onto the spinning disk, and created 5.8 million spatially regular time-stamped tiles. And this sets about 0.4 petabytes. And what you can actually do is go to a farmer's field or, um, say, a dam or a lake and actually drill through 30 years of data in seconds to actually see the changes in the landscape or in the water volumes. So this is an example of one of the pieces of work we've done where we took 15 years at 25 metres and have recorded um, what the water um, availability was in that pixel at that time. And now we have all this material together in a, um, what we call a data cube. We can do the whole archive in three hours. So again, people are trying different algorithms on the same data set. Again, this is about being able to have your data organized so that you can do multiple types of processing on it. 
At the same time, uh, which I think is interesting with people building infrastructures, is that people say, well, I don't want your big infrastructure because I'm only going to look at this particular area in Canberra. Just give me four scenes and I will do the processing and I will organise it. Whereas, unfortunately, we couldn't get the movie to run, but what you could actually do is come to this um, area and scale it down to take the more specialised use cases. What this means is that when you build the bigger infrastructures, you can actually scale down to them. Whereas if you're coming the other way, you tend to build a lot of repetitive infrastructures as you go to bigger and bigger scales. And it's often hard to get the two communities to talk to each other because I know the minute I mention Petabyte, my old colleagues in the long tail um, community where I come from just switch off. They're not interested. This is another example of what you can do. And this is an example of some work we're trying to do between the Bureau of Meteorology and Geoscience Australia. So in the Bureau system, they could track tropical cyclones and those systems go over hundreds of kilometres and an individual track can be thousands of kilometres long. The global circulation models that help you predict where they're going to go are at a scales between 20 and 200 kilometres. And how can we take these global data sets to solve local problems? And so modelling the wind fields needs to be at a sufficient resolution to capture the peak wind. And that necessitates, necessitates a grid spacing now of one to two kilometres. And then when you want to do the hazards impact of how that um, tropical cyclone is going to impact, you're down to scales of 30 metres. And so when we were doing this before, it would take the Bureau a few days to do the modelling, um, to then pass it on to Geoscience Australia to do the next thing and keep going down in scale. And what that would mean is the impact of the cyclone was well and truly over before we could predict what it was going to do. But now by having all this data together on the one infrastructure, we really feel that we can start to um, do all sorts of new real-time science. This will be an absolute boon for the hazards modelling community, particularly as well at the scales and the high resolutions that we can now operate for real-time prediction. But we're not just the digital dumpster for the large data collections. Because of the time frames to try and get this big data set onto this infrastructure, that has been our main goal. But equally as well, for those of you that are in the satellite community or geophysics community, you have to use ground truthing and ground measurements. There's a plethora of that data. And so we have to start to focus about bringing the small volume observational collections because of the Vs, they are the value and are a significant part of our scientific output. But they're very labour intensive to manage and very heterogeneous. And having the two mindsets working on the one um, infrastructure creates some interesting clashes. But um, again, this is something that will be a work in progress. As I said, at the moment we're focusing on trying to harmonise those really big data collections. So when you look at the long tail, as I said, the long tail is astronomy, high energy physics, sorry, the head, the big data, and then the long tail dominates in the Earth and environmental sciences. Long tail characteristics is it's low volume on sea drives, hard to find, collected by a large numbers of people, etc., etc. But what we kind of are hoping and working towards is that just as what happened to the dinosaur, the meteorite will come in and um, we won't have a long tail problem because people will think more about as they're collecting the data harmonising and collecting it so it's standardised can start to be moved and aggregated in these big collections to actually um, be of more value. So um, what I'd like to do now is just kind of review what I've said. Um, this is our scenario. As you can see, we have all this data sitting on these high-performance um, compute infrastructures and so what are the challenges that we are facing? So first thing is we're trying to bring the data in from these disparate collections, convert them in curated collections and have them ready for access. So we're actually using data management plans in an interesting way. 
because we have the organisation that stewards the data and then they're handing it over to us. And so we actually say, well, the data management plan is federated between the two of us and we have to agree on like how we're going to implement DOIs and we have to also balance what the steward wants for their data as opposed to what we need if we're going to aggregate it together. We also find that we have to have a ca capability to deal with different forms of access and so these data collection, data management plans are put into our back-end master database from which we can also serve different profiles of how the data will be accessed depending on where it comes from because we can't just have a single system. We're also looking at um, the lens architecture so that we've got a top level catalogue that lets you know we have these major collections but then we've also got to be able to have domain user or spe domain specific or deep queries or be able to actually then get into the data itself. This is a work in progress but we know we have to get there because if you want to use the data in situ you have to be able to allow the exploration across all the connections to be able to get the data that you want for your modelling or analysis exercise. As I said many times, we cannot store the data in multiple formats. This is a big issue with the satellite data collections that we have because most groups are happy with net 3 EFCF, whereas one group's insisting on doing it in GeoTIFF. Um, that's not a problem if you're downloading and locally processing, but when the collection's a petabyte, it's pretty expensive to store two petabytes when it's in two different formats. So we're looking towards, and this again is just a suggestion and a work in progress, we're looking towards the new work that's coming out on HDF5. And the important thing with HDF5 is that it can take the worry out of enabling the data to be used in parallel architectures and to be MPI enabled. What we then have on top are the um, access mechanisms. So you're trying to preserve, like if you take this, the uh, SEGY, which is geophysics, you do have a tool in Globe Paratus to um, access the data. So that's dealing with the vertical. But where we'd like to go is to start to put in a variety of services and fast whole of catalog libraries so that then we can actually start to do the cross-domain science that we want because one thing that people have talked about for years is doing this, but when you actually have the situation that we have where we've started to put this together, we're finding there are substantial domain boundaries based on the formats or the um, standards that each community is using. And so we have to start to work towards greater um, collaboration to break out of what we call these those pipe silos. The important thing with this as well is that we're saying we need to free access from the prison of the portal. Portals are built, visiting platforms are for building on. Portals present aggregated content in a way that facilitates exploration, but in many cases, the experience is predetermined by what the builder thinks you want or you think is relevant. In turn, platforms which is what we're aiming for, puts the decisions into the hands of the users. And there are innumerable ways that the users can interact with that data and we're facilitating it. So platforms offer many more opportunities for innovation. New interfaces can be built, new visualised framed, and ultimately new science will rapidly emerge. So our focus is on building platforms first. And then we feel another community, if they want to, can start to build the specialised data portals. But we can't build the portals um, too fast because otherwise you're promoting that vertical and those stovepipes. And if you can only get at the data through a specific portal interface, it really starts to limit your capability to use this data in interdisciplinary science. And I guess my other key message is that um, we're not careful, portals are proliferating and they're going the way of the electric plug, which is very timely for me at the moment because I've been travelling around a bit and trying to plug into a lot of systems is quite hard. And from Australia, I've seen some brilliant data portals over here in Europe. 
but I can't plug my um, applications into them because they're not the formats um, are not as open as people would like to think they are. So really, we need to get out of the data silos and challenge the stovepipe science and start to think of shared system science and be able to actually go across all these different um, domain boundaries. And this is just um, a fairly, it's complex, but really what I'm saying is that in this figure is that we're starting to look at what the different um, science communities are using on our system. Are they using GeoNetwork? Are they using ERDAP, Hyrex, GeoServer? Um, you know, are they building data cubes? Are they using WPS? And start to work out what the patterns are amongst the different science communities to see where the common points are in which we can actually start to set up some sharing. And what we want to build are these trusted component bundles that will be able to go across the disciplines. So the data challenges to us is we want to allow multiple data types but try and standardise on the formats and the conventions. We want to have more programmatic interfaces and link up the data and compute resources. There definitely have to be much more server-side processing and we have to deal with issues of authentication and authorisation. We need to get semantic meaning into these big data sets so that we can actually um, start searching on the data. Unique identifiers are a bit of a nightmare in this kind of world and versioning is very important with these data sets. And what we're trying to do is manage large data across international data centres with, with the attached HPC organised to cope with high performance data collections. And we want to provide flexible platforms on which we can build internationally trusted community environments. The infrastructure challenges, as I said, the elephant in the room is data access. And you have to have this balance between your processing power and your ability to access the data. The focus is no longer on feeds and speeds. The focus is on on-demand direct access to large data stores. And if you think, well, okay, that's a problem of the future. As I said, it's now about a content and enabling HPC analytics directly on that content. And this is the point I was going to make, that if I pull out my iPhone 6 20 years ago, it would have been a supercomputer. But then my iPhone has access to a lot more data and a lot more bandwidth than what you had 20 years ago. And if you think about earth and environmental sciences, which are going back and dealing with data over the last 50 or 60 years, these are problems I think we need to start thinking seriously about. And it's just that we had this opportunity, opportunistic thing that happened to us that we managed to get this high performance data and this high performance computing platform together that we really feel we're starting to see what the problems are. So the sun is setting on traditional data access mechanisms. We need to access large and exponentially increasing volumes of science data and traditional file load technologies will not work. They don't scale. The HPC and HPD environments are increasingly too large or complicated to be architected separately. You have to co-design and couple them at inception. But properly architected, the new systems are scalable and adaptable from small scale, specialised science to better scale and soon to be exascale analytics. So I guess my key messages for you are think high performance data, not big data. Build platforms, not portals. Build to enable multiple use cases on the same data. Tune for in situ analysis, allow access through services. You need to co-locate the two, and please never mention file downloads again to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, uh, for this presentation. I would like to invite the participants to join me in applaud applauding you virtually. If you'd like to applaud the presenter, please use the feedback button and use the upload function. <laughs> um, and I would like also to invite you to ask questions through the Q&A panel. Um, we have a couple of questions already, Leslie, so I'm, I'm going to read them to you. 
Uh, first one from Bonnie, Bonnie Carroll, who is asking, how were the 39 petabytes of data collection selected? And did the selection of 39 petabytes related to, is related to the environmental science initiative? And the third part of the question is, was that discussion of the integ integrated environment? Okay, so the 39 petabytes are distributed over the eight nodes. So the NCI one has specialised more in earth and environmental sciences, whereas the one in Perth is related to the square kilometre array, so that's more for astronomy. Victoria is doing more life sciences. But to get the subsidised storage, what we did at NCI was you had to make a case to a scientific panel that this was a data set on which further research and you know, groundbreaking research could be done on. Um, so it was sort of done by a local panel first that they agreed these were the ones they were going to nominate followed by um, a further adjudication on those that these were acceptable for this storage. So um, I hope that answers that question. The decision for to do the high performance data and the integrated environment was a decision made by the NCI partners and board. Uh, a few of the other big data centres I've shown are really just gearing up for um, file download because see not all of them have only the Perth one and the Canberra one have the supercomputers attached to them. So uh, to some extent each data centre could do its own specialisation and through the governing board NCI decided to um, go that way. Um, is that does that answer that yes. question? So I guess Bonnie will will react further if um, if she has more questions. But she she has actually asked another question: um, Is a format and example of your DMTs available? Bonnie's oh, also put something. The selection was done by a peer review process. Yes, it was, and fairly, um, and it was done from the perspective of scientists. So the panel were actually scientists. They weren't selected because of some um, computer aspect of the data. It was that they were going to be valid for future science research. Uh, yes, the data management plans are available. I can probably circulate that. Um, another thing too is that the data management plans are harmonised with the 19115 standard, okay? And so therefore, from those plans, once we've agreed, we can automatically generate the metadata profile. Okay, we have, um, thanks Leslie. We have another question from uh, Bob Chen. Um, he's asking, in a project like the Landsat reformatting, is it possible to bring forward most of the original data or are decisions being made on scene, band selection, etc.? If so, how are these decisions made? Okay, I could probably give you more references to that, but yes, um, all the original data was installed, but decisions were made where um, like a scene that was 90% cloud cover, okay? Or, you know, there was something wrong with the scene. There were the decisions made. The important thing was that once the scene passed a certain criteria, it was then put into the collection. What that meant was that you didn't have a complete coverage, there were actually holes in the collection, but that was what it was designed to do. Um, I can send that. If, if I would like it, I, there's been papers written on how those decisions were made. Okay, so I think we can send a link to Bob um, for further, uh, with further details. We have a, a question from Marco Komak. Uh, who is uh, thanking you first for the interesting and comprehensive presentation and asking which disciplines dominate in the use of the data provided? And another part of the question is, do you back up the data? And if if yes, how often? Okay, so at the moment, it's mainly the climate and the marine community that are using it because they have been in the high performance area for some time. 
one of the difficulties with the earth scientists is that they just haven't been in this field and they're really finding it difficult to make the transition. There just isn't the software available. Most of the software, I like for geophysics processing, is parallel. I mean, is serial. Um, whereas climate and marine had made those transitions, but it's starting to happen. Um, what was the second part of? Oh yeah, the so, backup. Yes. Sorry. The backup's really interesting, Marco. Um, the data are backed up. But we're trying to rationalise that for two purposes because like with Geoscience Australia, you always backed up your data and the university backs up the data and you're kind of thinking, well, hang on, do we both need to be backing up the same data? So that's with the raw data, or sorry, the low level, level zero, level one data. The really interesting thing with the backup, as I showed you, we can completely analyse the um, 15 years of Landsat archive to create a data set um, in three hours. And that data set is something like 300 terabytes. Now, with the bandwidth between Geoscience Australia and the university, it would take three months to get that data set back to um, Geoscience Australia. So that's not a good idea, is it? And then you start to think about it and the length of time it takes you to back up that data on tape. At the moment, Compute power is in excess relative to storage costs, and we're not quite there yet, but some people are already starting to say, well, let's save the algorithm and the underlying data and just reprocess it if we have a disaster, um, rather than trying to retrieve a backup copy of that data from um, tape. So it's sort of a new world we're into. Very good, nicely, thanks. Another question from Marco. How do you stimulate data providers to contribute their data? Uh, and I guess in, in the format, uh, required format, and is data also used by the general public? If not, will this be possible in the future? Okay, so um, basically what happened was that this influx of money gave the universities um, better compute and cloud infrastructure than the agencies had themselves. That was a very great incentive to get the data over there. And then further, the other problem was was because the universities could use such large volumes of data, they started hitting the agencies for copies of the data. And um, it's a lot easier to have it installed on the university system so that the researchers can access it than trying to copy um, you know, terabytes of data onto USB hard drives and get it out to the university. So it was just one of those things that was um, the most practical way to do it. Um, the Geoscience Australia data, because not all the Bureau data is that way, is CC by four. Um, the data are also advertised through data.gov.au so, and the Australian National Data Service directory is also available to the public. So basically the data are accessible, but someone has to pay for the compute. Um, this is also causing a lot of grief with um, people like the minerals industry and um, the oil industry, because they also want to access the data, but the compute is more restricted for the research community. And so there's a bit of a upheaval going on in Australia where the research, the government agents are actually saying this research infrastructure has now become part of their operational sector. So um, I'm just saying we've got into new territory and we've technically done a few things and now people are working out the consequences of what we did. But with a chicken and egg situation, we had to prove we could do it before people could argue about who can access it. So that's an open question at the moment, Tom, Marco. Okay, thanks, Leslie. Um, I'll skip um, Washing Lee's question and keep it for the end because I think it will be our last question for today and give you um, the last question from Bob Chan. From a user point of view, does the Australian approach basically mean that users do their work in the cloud? And do they need to understand what is going on behind the scenes in the cloud? 
Um, that's why we have a dual system of the cloud versus the HPC. Because the HPC is for computationally intense batch processing. The cloud is more for interactive processing. So users can make their choice. But with the cloud systems, we have now started to build virtual laboratories. And with the virtual laboratories, which was that Nectar program I showed you, um, you can actually set up a laboratory where the user chooses the tools that they want to apply, selects the data, and off they go. Um, they don't necessarily need to understand what is going on behind the scenes. That's another can I say, a new bit of innovation that has taken place because of this um, system we have built. Okay, thanks, Leslie. Final question, and uh, we're almost on time to close this uh, webinar, will be from Guo Xing Li, and he's asking, will the high-performance data be one form of the next generation data centers? Yes, it has to be. Um, you you have to move, like with the satellite data, you just can't be trying to retrieve it scene by scene. The same thing's happening with geophysics data where you've got survey after survey after survey. So what you can actually do is use the high performance computing because you actually need a fair bit of grunt to produce these data sets. So yes, I just think high performance data is the next um, generation because the other thing too is that unless you address it then you're building these supercomputers and they're getting bigger and bigger but they just cannot access the data in real time to make them worth building at these big, bigger scales so the two go hand in hand and that's kind of why the new thing is that um, it's not about the data being in the same country or the same city. The data now has to be in the same room and the same rack on the same node as the processing. And so that's the trick with high performance data is to how you take a cohesive data set and then be able to spread it out over the nodes. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, I think this was a very good conclusion to your presentation and to this discussion. Um, we will close the webinar now, and I would like to um, thank again the participants for joining us. You will be redirected at the end of this webinar uh, to register for the next WDS webinar, which will be given by John Helly, and the title will be Big Data, Little Data, and Everything in Between. So we're still um, around the same topic. And there will be a very short uh, satisfaction survey. Um, if you can give us your feedback, it would be much appreciated. Thank you, Leslie, again, and thanks for the participants. Goodbye. Oh, and I'd like to thank the British Centre for helping me set this up. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good Goodbye.